Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for an introduction to New Frontier. Uh, I am Margaret Sargent. I work on our marketing team, uh, and I have spoken with many of you in the past. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by our CIO, Robert Michaud. Uh, so today's webinar is going to provide a comprehensive overview of who we are and what we do, including a look at our investment philosophy and process, as well as how that plays out in our portfolios. Uh, then we'll have a couple of quick notes on marketing resources that are available to all of you, uh, and then finally some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note, your lines will be muted for the duration of the call to reduce ambient noise, so if and when you do have questions, please submit those using the chat feature of GoToWebinar. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass things over to Robert. Thanks, Margaret. I'll, I'll start by uh, talking a bit about our investment strategies. Uh, we are global strategic ETF model portfolios, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> but I would like to say that strategic does not, however, mean very simple portfolios with a very simple process that stays the same over time. I'll explain uh, today exactly what our process is, why uh, <clears throat> a sophisticated process can enhance the value of a strategic portfolio how, and why that's important since we're not relying upon market timing or investment guru or inside knowledge to uh, provide value. It's all about the process. And so everything today here is that I will be talking about will be applying to our standard, our tax sensitive, and our multi-asset income portfolios. So I will start with a history of the firm. Uh, we came into being because we had this I an idea for how to improve modern portfolio theory by taking a more statistical approach to the portfolio construction process and considering how you should invest given that you don't have perfect information about the future. So we really started as a research and advisory firm, but then we quickly transformed into a technology company to spread these ideas through our software. Our technology business was doing quite well and was being used to manage over a trillion dollars. But given our asset management background, uh, we were waiting for the right time to manage portfolios ourselves. So in 2004, uh, we became an ETF strategist. A number of things had aligned. Uh, the prevalence of ETFs, uh, as well as advisory platforms, that it made it possible for a firm like us to really focus on investments, while uh, asset mark um, and, and now other uh, platforms uh, have made it possible for advisors to get access to uh, our ideas in a, a pure form and uh, neither of us have to do all of the back office type of work um, that had been required of individual investment companies. So uh, 2004 seemed like the right time to start. This actually made us one of the original ETF strategists, especially considering that there were maybe other firms at the time that were making tactical moves and using ETFs for their liquidity, but I believe we were the first true global multi-asset class strategist that focused on portfolio construction, and so it's really been fun to be around uh, right from the beginning. Um, but going back to our ideas, uh, we do a lot of research on many problems in investments, portfolio construction, and, uh, and measuring uh, risk in portfolios. Uh, we publish in refereed journals, we've written some books, and uh, our original book was actually uh, quite unique, uh, listed up there. And this was a, uh, a actually commissioned by a number of Harvard Business School professors who are looking for the world's expert on asset allocation and portfolio construction, and so they asked us to write it. And not too many people can say they got a commission like that. Um, so you can read about many of the ideas uh, that are actually used in our investment process and our portfolios uh, in this books and in our papers. Um, many of them are patented, so you can uh, read about it through our patents. And so this makes us something of a, a really uh, unique and unusual company in that uh, so much of what we do, it may be sophisticated, but it's very transparent. Um, so the ETFs that we use are transparent, but also the investment process uh, that we use is transparent. And uh, furthermore, we're using uh, our research ideas 
uh, as uh, both that are implemented through our software, and we're using our own technology to build portfolios. And um, and uh, and so this also uh, makes us something of a different company, uh, having both a technology and an investment focus. So. <clears throat> I'd uh, talk a, a little bit now about our uh, investment philosophy and our process. And really what that is, is we'd like to start with some of the best ideas and practices of institutional asset management and see how we can build upon them and, and even improve upon them uh, without taking additional risks. But let's start off with the things that we avoid. Um, there's some cute examples here, and, uh, but fundamentally we want to add value by not making mistakes. It helps that we're not just investing behaviorally uh, or with our gut, but we have a solid process that we can build upon and rely upon through many different market environments. And maybe another way to say this is uh, that we avoid bets everywhere we can. Uh, we also ignore CNBC and things like that. And the more you can do of those things, uh, the better off your investments will be. So just going through this list, uh, you know, predicting the future is one of the most uh, tempting things that everybody tries to do. But if you've ever uh, tracked people who do it, uh, you find that they're often worse than coin flips. Uh, similarly, picking your favorite stocks, you hear about Tesla and other things like that. But again, uh, stock pickers tend to actually underperform monkeys. If you say a stock picker is no better than a monkey, you're actually being unkind to monkeys. Uh, and and picking favorite mutual funds uh, isn't much better than picking stocks. Uh, there's a large literature of uh, the persistence of uh, performance among mutual funds and all of the things that the consultants have tried. Uh, at, again, at best, you're ending up with a coin flip in terms of are you picking a good mutual fund or not? And if you're not putting a lot of effort into it, you're actually, again, doing much worse than a coin flip because after fees, that the average active managed mutual fund is going to underperform the market. Uh, now, as far as picking your favorite asset class, you've all seen the periodic table of asset class returns. And the funny thing about that to remind you is that you're actually better off investing in the worst asset class every year than the best, although there's clearly some risk in that. Uh, so most people are not going to actually recommend that strategy. And then finally, timing markets. Uh, it's hard to stay invested when you're scared, and it's hard to not get greedy when things seem so great. Uh, but that's been proven again and again that uh, avoiding these mistakes is going to make your portfolio better off. So that's a lot of things that we don't do. Uh, what do we actually do? Uh, so first of all, diversification. So we want to diversify in every possible way that we can across securities, across asset classes, across risk factors, even uh, geogra uh, geographical regions, and even over time, to the extent that that's possible, you want to diversify your portfolio and spread out the risk that you're exposed to. Then, of course, if you, to the extent that you can, you want to manage costs, and so certainly don't trade any more than you need to. Uh, you want to focus on the quality of the ETF, not just the cost and the what the ETF brings to you, but you, of course, uh, are better off paying less in fees. And then uh, if you're a tax sensitive uh, port, uh, investor, then of course you also need to manage taxes and that can have a big impact on your portfolio. And then the improving upon the institutional process of having uh, strategic forecasts with a lot of thought behind them, but you don't want them to be rooted in the past and static. And so we add uh, currently available data, uh, we've had uh, economic theory, uh, but we want to do all of this to uh, avoid speculation and, and investing on whims. And uh, maybe the most unique part of us is how heavily we rely upon optimization uh, to deliver investment value. Optimization does a few things. Uh, one is it's the natural way to balance risk and return and uh, build different types of portfolios. Uh, but if you do it right, you're actually not just balancing risk and return, but you're maximizing return and minimizing risk. And more subtly, it's really the right way to build a portfolio for different investor objectives. So we have uh, quite a number of portfolios, but they're built for different investor objectives and optimization is really key for that. So um, our, 
uh, and this is all part of our process. Uh, so really the four steps are pick an asset class with an identifiable return premium or a unique diversification property, uh, build capital market forecasts that are strategic, not static, uh, using a combination of economic theory and current information, as well as uh, relying upon uh, data to understand how assets move together and their risk. Uh, we have a patented optimization uh, that um, is actually is what we use to create the specific portfolio of 15 to about 27 different ETFs. And then we rebalance uh, and uh, run a rebalance test to monitor the portfolios every single night. Um, uh, steps two and three of this process are uh, we review in our investment committee that meets every week. Uh, and step four actually is done on a daily basis uh, through our uh, technology. Now, this uh, process applies to all of our strategies. They have the same investment committee, the same capital market assumptions, similar ETFs that they could be investing in, but we're using optimization to build them for a very different uh, investment objectives. So one way that uh, investment objectives are stratified is through risk. So a conservative portfolio and an aggressive portfolio need to have very different considerations in how they're built rather than just putting uh, the same thing in them, but more stocks or more bonds. Now, after tax optimization is, is a, uh, a nice way to understand how our uh, optimization and our process uh, can vary for different objectives. Now, what some people will do when they go from a, a standard to a tax sensitive portfolio is just take out their uh, aggregate bond funds or their treasury bond funds and put in municipal bond funds. Now, uh, clearly you can do better than that if you have an optimization process uh, that lets you do things specifically. So first of all, what we do is we will um, redo the capital market assumptions for a high marginal uh, tax in, uh, rate investor. And so this requires an understanding of not just taxes, uh, but also uh, how, what percentage of the dividends from these ETFs are qualified and, uh, and then you can adjust the uh, risk and return estimates for every individual asset class to be more reflective of what a, um, a tax sensitive investor would actually uh, receive from those. Uh, and you, uh, in addition to that, you do need a good understanding of how the portfolio turns over and how much capital gains you're likely to realize over time. So we build this into our process to make a uh, new tax sensitive um, uh, capital market assumptions, and then have an optimization process that explicitly uh, takes the tax impact into account to build a tax-sensitive portfolio. And you get a much more appropriate portfolio for taxable investors. So instead of just swapping into the municipal bond fund, you have, in addition to that, uh, subtle but important shifts, maybe away from value stocks uh, and a little bit more towards growth stocks, but also for some of these asset classes like REITs, uh, which we don't want to just uh, get rid of entirely because they may still have some valuable diversification properties, uh, but they're less valuable because of the way that they uh, return a lot of, um, they provide a lot of return to investors through uh, less tax advantaged income. Uh, and then finally, our um, income oriented portfolios. These are built for a very different type of investor. They're built for an investor who's not just thinking about the total return of their portfolio, they're thinking about the how reliable the income is and how likely that income is to grow over time. And you might notice that there is only a profiles two to four, uh, so they do not span the very conservative and very aggressive ends of the risk spectrum. And that's because that uh, we don't believe that these are actually appropriate. If you're in a low interest rate environment, there's no such thing as a ultra conservative income uh, type of investor. And also it doesn't particularly make sense to have an ultra aggressive uh, income and investor. So um, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, ETFs and how we choose asset classes. So uh, we are a independent uh, manager, so that leaves us free to pick our uh, the ETFs that we think are best for the portfolio and best for investors. And um, there are definitely not our full list of ETFs um, up here, but what we wanted to do is show you that we get exposure 
to uh, different risk premia, value, size, uh, volatility, uh, different geographical regions, uh, Europe, Pacific, emerging markets, uh, even single country exposures. Uh, it's important to note that we do not ever bet on a single country, uh, but there may be times where we need exposure to a single country uh, like China, for instance, because it's, it's not well represented in the uh, broad indices uh, that we use and that it's important for diversification properties. And then, of course, we have uh, real estate, uh, gold, and a variety of domestic and international uh, fixed income as well that allows us, again, to have exposure to the fixed income risk premium, which is most notably uh, duration and uh, credit risk. Um, so, on to how we build our capital market assumptions. So, this is the core of where our strategic but not static investment process begins. So, we want to go beyond uh, just looking at historical data. Uh, historical data is highly unreliable in terms of what it says about the future. Uh, we know that the past is not going to repeat itself, uh, but there is some information that you can get from the past, uh, most notably the uh, an understanding of the volatility of asset classes and how they move together, um, but very little information about future returns. So we use sophisticated statistics to separate some of the signal from the noise of historical data, but then we have to build that back up with economic theory is quite important. Uh, things like uh, the literature on uh, the various risk premia, like the value uh, premia or the biggest of all the equity uh, premium, See what a reasonable expectation is for how much stock should be uh, likely to outperform bonds going forward. Uh, but I'll, and then uh, finally, uh, the last piece is uh, current information. And so current information uh, can be uh, very visible signals like the yield curve. It can be short-term volatility estimates. It can be ways to improve uh, with things that we actually know from the market today what our understanding of risk and return among all the different asset classes is right now. Right? So that's really the goal that we're trying to do. We're not trying to guess about the future, but we're really trying to understand what is the market telling us about risk and return trade-offs uh, going on right now, and how can we make the best use of all available data um, to, to get the clearest picture of that. So this is going to be an evolving picture over time. Now, when we want, what we really want to do is we want to build a portfolio uh, using all of this information. And I'll, I'll start by saying what we don't do. But what we don't do is just come up with our favorite list of bonds, our favorite list of stocks, and for every intermediate risk level, connect the dots. Now, I really don't like this for a couple of reasons. For one thing, the most aggressive investor uh, in this picture is getting the very same uh, exposure to stocks in the very, as the most conservative and the similarly with bonds. So what that means is a uh, aggressive investor is going to have the same ratio of emerging market stocks to uh, large cap domestic stocks as the most conservative investor. So intuitively, that just can't possibly be correct. That can't be the best thing to do. So optimization should be solving this problem. It can help you. It can, and the other thing, of course, optimization can do is maximize return and minimize risk. So this is what I was saying at the very beginning is that optimization is doing two very powerful things uh, for us in terms of providing value through in, in our portfolios. One is providing a more appropriate portfolio that's more appropriate for an aggressive investor or a conservative investor. And the other is uh, presumably uh, enhancing uh, value through uh, better risk adjusted uh, returns. Um, this picture here is a, uh, does do a good job of explaining how even a strategic manager uh, can have a portfolio uh, that does well. Even though we're not trying to time the market, our conservative portfolios uh, can be quite defensive and do very well in challenging market environments. In 2008, our conservative portfolio was written up as the, of every existing ETF strategy, the third best performer. And that's not because we went to cash. That's because we built the whole portfolio to um, to be conservative and do well in uh, in <clears throat> uh, in volatile markets. 
Now, why doesn't everybody optimize? Why doesn't everybody get the benefits that I was talking about? And one problem is, is that it's not easy to do well. You might have heard some of the criticisms of modern portfolio theory. You might have heard some people who uh, have said that optimizers uh, don't work. And uh, part of our early research was to see, well, why is this? Uh, Markowitz optimization theory is such a great theory. It's really trying to solve the right problem. Uh, why doesn't it provide better investment outcomes? And so what our experiment was is we said, well, how wrong can optimization be? And so what we did is we replayed history a little bit in a simplest case we could think of. And, uh, and then here's pictures of 25 different pictures of the way history actually could have been replayed and the type of optimal portfolios you'd have in each case. And what you see is that you can have uh, extremely different uh, efficient frontiers, uh, slightly different assumptions uh, about risk and return uh, and the correlation among asset classes lead to very, very different uh, investment suggestions uh, by modern portfolio theory. And that's because it's, it's backward looking and it's very specifically telling you what you should have done. But if that's not what happens again in the future, you could be very specifically doing the wrong thing. And if you can uh, sort of think about, well, what's a better way to invest? Well, how can you invest through all this uncertainty instead of being specifically betting on the wrong scenario? So what we did is we said, rather than bet on one very specific investment outcome, let's diversify again uh, across all the ways that we could be wrong, all the ways that the future could be different and build this portfolio that's a, a very well diversified portfolio it's optimized over literally thousands of investment scenarios. And these include uh, things with tail risk, black swans, times when um, small cap stocks don't do as well as you expect them to do, and so on. And uh, this was a, the big result in our book. We were very excited about it. And uh, someone else who was very excited about it was Harry Markowitz. He said, how did these guys improve upon his life's work? And so he spent a few years uh, trying to find a way to keep modern portfolio theory intact. And what he uh, happened at the end was he said he published 30 different tests. And he, in his words, he said, me show optimization beats Markowitz optimization on average in every single one of his uh, 30 tests. And so this is quite a nice endorsement uh, from the father of modern portfolio theory to say that uh, what we're doing is really the best way that uh, anyone knows of to construct well diversified portfolios. And this is just a quick look at what modern portfolio theory before and after. On the left, you have a very concentrated portfolio where actually if you look in the middle, you'd see there's just the dark blue and the light green. Uh, and that's just uh, the light green in this case is all small cap value stocks. And clearly you can't just have one equity in a balanced portfolio. On the right, you have a much better diversified portfolio. This is another way of saying that uh, with a better diversified portfolio, you can never predict the future, but you can have more reliable outcomes. Uh, these graphs show the spread uh, going forward uh, across the risk spectrum of uh, what types of returns that you're likely to get uh, from your portfolio. Now, the last piece is rebalancing. And as I mentioned, uh, we have our wanted to have a rebalance test that instead of just doing what um, some of the conventional uh, rebalancing suggestions were, which is trade once a year uh, or just leave it up to some asset ranges, uh, plus or minus 5% around every ETF uh, to determine when you're going to rebalance your portfolio, we thought it was important to actually uh, serve the dual purpose of adding value to the portfolio uh, by rebalancing when and only when it's beneficial to investors. And uh, the way we did this is we looked at these thousands of scenarios of uh, the ways that the future could unfold and, and uh, calculated in what percentage of uh, these scenarios are you better off uh, sticking with this uh, the green portfolio, which is the in 
portfolio in your investor's account right now, which has drifted away from the optimal for two reasons. Uh, one, because prices have changed and the uh, relative weights of the portfolio have shifted over time. Uh, but the other one is it's not the same portfolio that uh, we were suggesting a, a month ago or a year ago, uh, is that uh, there are subtle changes that mean that the risk and return relationships are different, mean that the, meaning that the portfolio that's best for somebody to invest in today uh, is evolving slowly. And so we wanted a way to uh, measure uh, in, a, in a rigorous sense without just uh, using our gut to say uh, what percentage of the time, uh, what's the likelihood that an investor would actually benefit from having their portfolio rebalanced. So this is the rule that we use to determine when to trade the portfolios. And uh, in the last 13 years or so, uh, we've rebalanced our portfolio between one and three times every year. So that's the end of our process. And I would like to uh, sort of do a quick refresh and then uh, dive into a couple more points after this. Uh, so we're extremely globally diversified. Uh, we, uh, our portfolios are uh, risk targeted. Um, we're very disciplined in terms of when we say we're delivering a 60-40 portfolio, every time we rebalance, we rebalance uh, right back uh, to that risk target. Uh, our portfolios are designed to be optimal, uh, not just over the short term or just over the long term. They're designed to uh, be the uh, efficient at every point in time. Uh, one thing, way that I like to um, explain this is that we can't guarantee an outcome at any particular point in time. Uh, I don't think anyone can, but what we can do is try to have a portfolio that's invested as intelligently as possible at each point in time uh, so that we have the right risk exposures and the, and, um, and the right portfolio for any investment objective. And a way I like to think of this is uh, we're suggesting uh, that, the, that there's a coin that's likely to be head slightly more often than not. And so although we can't guarantee the next flip, we can say that a consistent strategy of betting on heads is the best thing to do for every single flip. And we can say that if you get enough uh, observations of this, then we can say with very high confidence that this will indeed be the right strategy, not just uh, ahead of time, but also the strategy that you'll be happy to have had uh, going through. So. Um, to, to focus in on a few key points that we found really help people explain uh, what's going on. Uh, one thing is to focus on our tax sensitive portfolios. Our tax sensitive portfolios are uh, really quite, uh, have performed quite well. Uh, their performance has been very much in line with our standard portfolios, uh, but they have uh, our, the ETFs that we use have uh, rarely, almost uh, very rarely issued capital gains. Occasionally, a, uh, interest rates do something unexpected, and uh, a fixed income ETF might have a very small capital gain in it. But you can essentially, uh, you know, round that down to zero. Um, and ETFs also have the benefit that you'll not have any tax consequences from the actions of other investors. We're a low enough turnover strategy that we can actually minimize and almost eliminate short-term capital gains uh, and control longer-term capital gains as well, of course. Um, but uh, it's important to remember that our primary objective for all of our strategies is having the right portfolio and good risk control. So if ever some sort of cataclysmic event happened, uh, we would rather uh, have some taxes in the portfolio than have a portfolio that was dramatically the wrong portfolio for investors. And then finally, we of course do uh, tax optimization in our portfolios, where rather than just substituting in municipal bonds, we have a sophisticated uh, tax optimization process across all asset classes. The other interesting uh, portfolio is our multi-asset income portfolio. And if you uh, look into it, you will see that there's a, a lot more of a reliance on uh, stock dividends to be providing the income uh, rather than high yield bonds, which is uh, what some other uh, income oriented uh, ETF portfolios tend to re uh, rely upon. 
And uh, the reason why we wanted to do that is because we care a lot about risk and we care a lot about uh, having the right portfolio for investor objectives. And you don't want the conservative portfolio to be full of high yield bonds. You want a conservative portfolio to always be actually more conservative than the aggressive portfolio. And, uh, and furthermore, we really think that dividends are sort of the, the most appropriate way to meet long-term income objectives because dividends are actually quite reliable uh, in spite of occasionally GE slashing a dividend. If you have a thousand dividend paying stocks, you don't have to worry so much about uh, just one of them in your portfolio. They also are better inflation hedge and grow with the economy and grow with your economic liabilities, which is important uh, for sustaining uh, a particular lifestyle over a period of time. And so dividends do a better job of this than, um, than uh, bond yields, bond coupons. Uh, but of course, we don't want to forget about uh, capital appreciation in the portfolio either. So all of those things are, are taken into account. And uh, a last uh, specific illustrative example is that uh, I mentioned that we have a portfolio that doesn't just give uh, more stocks to aggressive investors and more bonds to conservative investors, but it really builds a portfolio that's more appropriate for different types of investors. And so what I did is I took the, a, a, a conservative portfolio and I took the 80% of bonds and blew that up to be a whole pie chart. And I took an aggressive portfolio and took that smaller portion of bonds and blew that up into a whole pie chart to just show you what the stocks and the bonds look like inside, um, just the bonds in this case, look like inside two different portfolios. So these are both uh, total return standard portfolios, but you can see that in the conservative portfolio, there's a lot of short term, there's a lot of uh, mortgages, uh, not much high yield or international or emerging exposure. Um, and in the more aggressive portfolio, the light blue in the top right quadrant, uh, the short term bond treasuries goes completely away, for instance. And there is a lot more of a longer duration uh, exposure to emerging markets bonds and high, higher yield, which is intuitively what you would expect for a more aggressive investor. Um, the one thing that I, I don't want people to get fixated on is that we independently manage stocks and bonds. We're always thinking about the characteristics of the total portfolio. Um, and so there is, of course, a sophisticated other side to this of what's going on with the stocks at the same time. And uh, to really sum things all up uh, and, and try to hopefully say that maybe there are a couple of uh, sophisticated ideas that would go over the heads of most uh, of your clients, uh, but they're simple principles. And so we're, we're strategic, but we're not static. Uh, so we're not a fickle investor, uh, but uh, all of our decisions are based on evidence and data and we need to adapt to the market when it changes. We don't want to just be looking into the past and we don't want to be blind to the future. Uh, then we don't gamble. We avoid bets of every conceivable kind. And so there's all the conventional bets of market timing and picking asset classes and stocks, uh, which we avoid, of course, uh, but there's the more subtle bet of <clears throat> Uh, betting on just one market scenario, betting that small cap and value are going to be the only thing that you need to have in your portfolio uh, because they'll continue to outperform as well in the future as in the past. Um, <clears throat> we want to position our portfolio to perform across thousands of plausible market scenarios and, and many ways uh, that things could work out in the future. And then finally, we're best at what matters most. Uh, we're a, a a smaller company and we can compete and we have competed and we've had uh, quite favorable performance uh, compared to many major Wall Street firms that we've seen have their strategies come and go. And that's because we've uh, always focused on the process and we focused on asset allocation uh, where we can add more value than any other part of the investment process. Uh, we don't need actively managed funds uh, if we can do smarter asset allocation. So that's it. I'll pass it over to Margaret. Great. So just a couple of quick notes uh, from your marketing team on the resources that are available to you. Um, you know, as I go through this, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those using the chat function of GoToWebinar. Um, so you know, just in terms of people that you should be familiar with, 
Uh, there's myself and my colleague Nick Lamb. Uh, we work really primarily as the internal desk here, so we are the people who will be manning the phones when you call in. Uh, and then David Schubach, our Director of Business Development, is really our boots on the ground. Uh, he's the face that you are most likely to see, uh, and I'm sure we'll all come to appreciate. Uh, he is, he's a great resource um, and, you know, is happy to meet with you where you are. Um, we're all here to answer any questions you might have, so please feel free to reach out to any of us uh, via email or phone, you know, with any questions that you might have about New Frontier products. Uh, in terms of online resources, we have our Frontier Advisor Portal, which is really designed to be a one-stop shop resource center for advisors. Uh, it has portfolio analytics, it has a whole slew of materials uh, and an overview of New Frontier, uh, both our, our background story and our process. Uh, so if you're looking for anything in the way of materials or information, uh, that's really a great stop. So if you haven't already made an account, please do. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us with any questions about that. And then I would also encourage all of you to check out our blog, um, which you can find on our website, uh, newfrontieradvisors.com slash blog. Um, and that's, you know, there'll be a whole number of notes from our investment committee on issues that are topical and top of mind for advisors. Um, actually, one of our most recent pieces, When Market Highs Are About Perception, which Robert wrote, uh, was recently featured on ETF.com. So again, that is newfrontieradvisors.com slash blog for a whole number of helpful notes from our investment committee. Uh, and that does it for our notes from marketing. Um, so we can turn it over to questions from you guys. Um, and I think it looks like we have a, a couple of different questions relating to how we choose ETFs. So I guess, Robert, if you want to talk a little bit about you know, how we determine which ETFs we're choosing, um, why we would make changes to it, and specifically, um, you know, what role commodity ETFs have played in our portfolios. Um, okay, so I'll start with the easy thing. Uh, so commodities are really just there for diversification. Uh, given that uh, a lot of people have commodities for what I would call speculative reasons, uh, we want to avoid anything like that. And so when we model them, we actually model them with a zero uh, real rate of return. Uh, to make sure that we're not buying any more commodities than we have to. Uh, kind of like how we think about international uh, op opportunities, uh, we do. We have a uh, what's called a Bayesian prior, which we put into our uh, <clears throat> estimation process that makes sure that we do not have any higher expectation for international markets than we do for domestic. Um, so, uh, what we're looking for at ETFs is we're really trying to span every uh, source of global return available uh, and, uh, and every type of uh, risk mitigation uh, possible. Um, we're looking uh, across all ETF providers. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, iShares and Vanguard and State Street and others in there. Um, and so we're, we're agnostic there, uh, and we, but we will be making sure that since we do manage a fairly large portfolios that they have sufficient liquidity. The most important thing though is, uh, do, are we convinced that the ETFs are going to behave the way that we want them to? Um, and, and then finally, expense ratios are important and so we'll actually have a, a, a column in our, uh, an input column in our optimizer uh, where you enter the uh, expense ratio uh, to, to uh, penalize that. Uh, for higher expense ratios and our, when it comes time to actually build the portfolios and have the uh, construction process. The, um, the other sort of interesting thing is why would we pick uh, individual country ETFs? Um, and each one of those has a, a very different story. Um, there's been times uh, several years ago where everybody was talking about BRICS. You know, if you're, why is anyone investing in anything other than those? And, um, and so what we actually did is we wanted to have a, a, a really a rigorous way to be able to test, well, uh, does adding Russia to the portfolio actually enhance its risk and return characteristics? We found no. Uh, we went through all of the different uh, BRICS and we found out that actually, well, China is something different. Uh, it had a good reason. It's a large economy with a tiny uh, weight in emerging markets indices. 
uh, that's been growing over time, but it's still nowhere close to its economic footprint. Uh, and it really behaves quite different uh, from the rest of the asset classes in the portfolio. And so it, it has, uh, has been, especially in a year like this, has really uh, benefited our portfolio. Um, but again, it's not a bet that we think that China is going to outperform everyone else. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an acknowledgement uh, that we want better diversification and that there is, of course, a uh, return premium there. Um, just very briefly, something like Switzerland is just there to diversify the risk of the rest of the Eurozone. Um, Great. Um, so I think that is all we have time for today, unfortunately. If you do have any other follow-up questions that we weren't able to get to, uh, please feel free to reach out by phone or email. We'll be happy to field those. Uh, also, keep an eye out for a recording of this webinar that we'll be sending out in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you again all for joining us and have a great rest of your afternoon.